Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Kamadaf Samach Aleph. This week's learning is sponsored in honor of Shoshana Baker. Mazal Tov on completing 4.039 Dafyomi cycles of marriage. You can all do the calculations with love and joy, Mark. Today's stuff is sponsored by Suri Stern in honor of the birth of a granddaughter, Halel Rus, daughter of Esther and Shai Goldman, and a loving memory of her father, her Ruve Ben Chaim, whose yurt site was on the 17th of Tibet. My father completed Chas many times and was an Anav as Gabay Rishon for the White Shul. Today's stuff is sponsored by Susan Kashdan in loving memory of her father, Yitzchak Ben Moshe Fona Zechrono Lebracha, and for the Rufuash of their little grandson, Ziv Shimon Ben Shulamit Chaya and Shulamit Chaya Bat Sara Devora. Okay, we're going to get started with um, the end of yesterday's stuff. We started this story of David Melech. Now, we had this kind of strange story. I'll, I'll actually just point out that the Gemara is actually really combining two different incidents that happen one right after the other. In the text of, of Sefer Shmuel Bet, you read them, you'll see they're, they're somewhat, um, they're somewhat basically two different stories. But the Gemara combines them, okay, the, the piles of lentils or, or uh, barley, which one appears in Sefer Shmuel and one appears in the parallel story in Chronicles. That story appears before the story when David is looking for water, but the Gemara combines them as if they're one. So we have the story with these piles of grains, which, you know, either lentils or, or barley. And then we have this story of David wanting water. He said his, he says, I really want water from Beit Lechem. Specifically, his three warriors or giborim, strong, you know, uh, henchmen, whatever they are, they go and they bring him water. But they go into the enemy camp to get the water from Beit Lechem. When, he, when they come back with the water, David, David gets very angry at them and says, I don't want this water. Why did you bring it to me from, you know, go into the enemy camp and risk your lives? And it says, by Yasef Hotam Hashem, he offers them his libations to God. We're going to have to figure out how our three versions of the story fit in with the wording of the text, okay? And some of the issues that are complicated in the text that make them think that. So again, the Gemara went off on, on understanding this in a drasha sort of manner. It wasn't really water he was looking for. That doesn't really make sense. You didn't have to go into the enemy camp to get water. It must be he was looking for water as always connected with Torah. He must have been looking for Torah. He was looking for some halachic question. And they answered him, and then he didn't accept their answer. So we have three versions. The first version was he asked them, what is the halacha about items that are hidden in a fire? Okay, a little bit strange that he'd be asking this, um, what this has to do with anything, and forget about the fact that Tanakam and Rabbi Yehudu have this whole debate about Tamun Be'esh are living way after David HaMelech, but that's not the point. The point is, it could have been a topic in his time. Maybe Rabbi Yehudu and the rabbis weren't the ones having the debate. But the point is, are things hidden in the fire? And by the way, that's going to be the end of our sugya for today, learning that sugya more in depth um, about whether things that are hidden in a fire, are we exempt from them if we cause a fire? That's the rabbi's position or Rabbi Yehudu's position. Second was that there were plishtim hiding in these piles of grains of the Jews. And he wanted to know, can I burn them in order to, right, to save our lives? Can I burn the plishtim with the grains? Is that appropriate or not? Again, we discussed those two options. Did he mean, can I burn them and but replace the, the you know, pay people back for them? Or can I burn them and, and not have to pay back at all because I was using it for pikuach nefesh, even though it wasn't my piles of grain, I'm allowed to destroy them for anything I want. Third question was, and this related to the fact that in one version it says lentils and the other version it said barley, which is there were two different piles we're talking about. One belonged to the Jews, one belonged to the Philistines. And David basically wanted to know, can I take the ones that are in our prop possession now that belong to Jews, feed them to our animals because our animals are hungry, and then later replace it with the pile of lentils of the Gentiles, of the Philistines. And in both the second two versions, we don't know really what happened at the end of the first version, but at the end of the second two versions, the rabbis basically, or the, the three giborim will come back and say, oh, we found an answer. By the way, it would mean, which is also a little bit strange, that they went into the Philistine camp to get the answer to the question. I don't know who was living there that was telling them the answer to this question, but they went into the Philistine camp to get the answer to the question. And then they come back and they tell David, according to both versions in the second, the second and the third, it was that they said to David, well, really, halachically, you're not allowed to do this, but you're the king and maybe... Okay, whether you add this or not, again, is a debate among the commentaries. Well, it's a time of war and a king can do anything in time of war. Or perhaps it just means a king in general is allowed to do whatever the king wants. And therefore, you could do whatever you want. 
And then David says, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to treat myself any differently than anybody else. And if it's not permitted by the letter of the law, then I'm not going to do it. Which, by the way, is something to think about in terms of we're actually getting to the end of a section now. We're going to end the whole first section above a comment soon. Okay, and uh, on Wednesday's daf already on daf samach bet, we're going to start Peret Merubah, which is the chapter all about theft. And then we're going to move from there to Hachovel about injuring a person, injuring another person. But we're really ending this whole section on a person's property, right? The Arba vote is a king. Again, what Adam maybe is, we're going to get back to if you say that one of them is Adam, but if you say they're all behemoth or your fire or your pit, we're ending that whole section. And maybe it's coming to say that there's the letter of the law and there's beyond the letter of the law, you know, and there might be something that's permitted to you, but maybe you shouldn't do it anyway. Maybe it's trying to kind of make a statement as we get to the end here, kind of similar to the, it's okay to do Bidei Adam, right? Bidei Adam, you won't be ruled, but in the Bidei Shamayim, you will be. Maybe also that's why this sort of comes up at the end as kind of ethical, you know, maybe it's not the right thing to do, even though theoretically you're allowed to. So that's in terms of um, something that comes out of this. So now we're going to start in my Gemara. It comes out five lines from the bottom of the daf of yesterday's stuff. We're going to now go through the three stories. Let's just remember the order because we're going to call them one, two, and three. The first is, is Tamun Be'esh permitted or not, right? Are you liable for things that are hidden like under a haystack? Number two is if Philistines were hiding in these, in these piles, can I burn them in order to save the Jewish people? Number three, can we give our animals to eat from the Jews' piles and then replace them with the, with the Philistine piles later? So Bishlam Alaman Damar Lufe. Version number three works very well. Okay, with this pasuk. That explains very well the fact that there's two different versions. And one says it was lentils and one says it was barley. Not that it was one pile and there was, a, you know, two different versions about what it was. But it makes sense that there were two piles. And one was relating to the one that belonged to the Jews and one was relating to the one that belonged to the Philistines. But, but if you say, he wanted to know, can I burn the stack with the plishtim inside? My bailu lahani cry, lahani tre cry. Why do you need one with lentils and one with barley? It doesn't make any sense that there would be two. We're talking about one stack that they were hidden in. According to version two, there were two stacks. There was one with barley and one with with uh, lentils. And the police were hiding in both of those. And that's why one mentioned that one and one mentioned that one. It was really part of the same thing. There were two of them all together. And that would explain that. If you say, okay, they're not yet dealing with the first one, which really seems to have nothing to do with any of this stuff. If you say, version number two, that he wanted to burn the pile. In those psukim, it says that he went, he stood by, by the pile, and he saved it. Saved it from what? Saved it from being burned. But it, if it meant he just wanted to replace them, right? Let them eat and then replace them with the other pile. My Vayetzila sounds more like saved it from a fire. Well, no, you could say, What do you mean? They wanted to feed it to the animals. That works perfectly fine. He saved it from being consumed by the animals. Consumed by fire, consumed by animals, either which way he was saving it. That's not really such a difficulty. Okay, now version two and three, which we've really been dealing with only right now, mix, you know, fits. That's why there's two different psukim here, one with solim, one with lentils. Ella, right? Because either there were two piles, actually, right, where the plishtim were hiding, or we were talking about replacing one with the other. But But if he was asking something hidden in a pile, okay, which, which makes sense in terms of, it was all about this pile and maybe something hidden in the pile and is it liable for damages of fire or not, which again is a little bit more distant from the story, what it has to do with. Right? Well, what do you need? One pasuk about lentils and one about barley. It doesn't make any sense. So to resolve that problem, they answer very simply by saying, if you hold it was option one, you hold that it was, he asked two questions. One, he asked just about in general, tamun be'esh, things hidden in a fire in a pile, are you liable for them? And in addition, he asked either question two or question three. 
okay? That it wasn't as simple as just that question. That really wouldn't make sense and it wouldn't explain the pile of lentils and the pile of, of uh, barley. So you'd have to go with option one, right? It's like those multiple choice questions, one, two, three, or four, or all the above or none of the above or one and two. or So basically you'd say, if you hold option one, you must hold also another option. If we take option two and three, it makes a lot of sense that David didn't want to accept it because they told him this decision, right? That you're allowed to do it even though no one else is. And David says, okay, I don't want to do that. Sorry, Amal, he said, because really by the letter of the law, it's forbidden, even though for me, it's permitted. Even by the letter of the law, for me, it's permitted. But since, right, it's not ethically appropriate to do for the average person, I'm not going to do it. But if he just asked, what do we hold about things hidden in a fire? All they did was find out what the tradition is. Do we say that you're liable for things hidden in a fire, in a pile or not when you burn that pile up in, a, in flames? What, what, what's the big deal of saying, I'm not accepting the tradition that you gave me? It doesn't make any sense. He wanted to know, What's the halacha? They told him, and he said, no, thank you. I don't want to accept that halacha. That doesn't make any sense. So now they add another whole element. It's not that he didn't accept the halacha. What does it mean? He didn't want to drink the waters. He didn't want, now we've learned many, many times that when you teach a halacha, you're supposed to pass it on in the name of the person who told you that halacha. Very important. And anyone who says it in the name of the person who told him, get brings redemption to the world, right? It's a very important thing. So what happens here? David didn't want to drink them, meaning he didn't want to pass on this tradition in the name of the people who told him about it. Why? Amar, kach mekublani mi beiti no shel Shmuel haramati. What I learned from Shmuel, right? Shmuel, the, the prophet. Kol amosir atzmo lamut al divrei Torah, ein omrim dvar halacha mishmo. This is a very interesting if you risk your life to get Torah, which these people did, they risk their lives by going into the Philistine camp to bring out halacha, which you might think they value, right? Which Torah is so important, worth risking your life for. No, it's not. Okay, you're actually, there are these things that say you're supposed to mimit atzmechal Torah. You're supposed to kill yourself to learn Torah, but it doesn't mean put yourself in a dangerous situation. It means work hard, okay? That kind of thing. But you're actually not supposed to endanger your life to get a tradition, okay? They shouldn't have, so he asked them, you know, I want, uh, I wish I had this tradition from Beit Lechem. You have to read the story like this. But he, again, the word is Bayit Ave. He desired it, the water. Whereas it didn't say, he said, go fetch me the water. Okay, so he desired to know the Salacha, but he didn't want them to actually go into Beit Lechem. It's not what he meant. You're not, like they missed the point. You're not supposed to. Learning Torah is important and getting traditions is important, but not to risk your life over them. And anyone who does, we don't say the Halacha in their name. And that's a tradition that David had, and that's why he didn't recite the Salacha in their name. Last line to figure out before we move on. So now we have the end of the story. It says, David poured the water out in libation to God. So what does this mean according to these three versions? Because it wasn't water, it was Halacha. So those two, which are always the last two because they're more similar to each other. Well, he did that for the sake of God. He said, right, God has a standard. And maybe there's a different standard for a king, but I'm not going to be, you know, hold myself to any different standard. I'm going to hold myself to the basic standard. That's kind of sanctifying in the name of God. But if he didn't say it in the name of the people who said it because they risked their lives, why is that? How in what way is that a libation to God? What it means, it means, it's almost like saying he kept them neutral, like without a name. He he put it like in the name of God. In other words, this is a tradition we have. Whereas out, whereas he didn't specify them by name. And therefore, it's basically like saying he sanctified it to God to a certain extent by saying maybe like it came from God. Again, it's a it's a loose connection, but it's saying that he didn't say it in their name. Okay, with that, we finished the three versions. Again, there's a lot to think about this story. I think the most interesting part really is those two second versions, which are really trying to say that the second and third, that David felt there was a, that there's an ethical, a moral code that maybe a king is allowed to pass and maybe in time of war, which is an interesting message, right? But you still have to hold yourself to certain standards. And, and he felt that 
as a king, I and, and maybe also is saying, God is the ultimate king, and I'm subjugated to God also. And therefore, I can't just do whatever I want. Um, okay, so interesting, uh, very interesting story. New Mishnah. So now if you pass over, uh, if I'm sorry, if the fire passes over a fence, that's four amo tall. So I build, I make a fire in my property, and then it, or I make a fire in your property, doesn't matter. And it goes over a fence that's four amo high, and it have to be not a flammable fence, like not made of wood, let's say. And it passes over there and causes more damage on the other side. O derech harabim, o nahar, or it passes over, there's a big empty, right? Normally we're, we're assuming the fire's caught on, you know, uh, grains or whatever it is. And then it goes to this empty area where there's nothing really to burn. If it passes through that area, which normally a fire wouldn't do, or a river, which also it doesn't usually go over a river, or possibly we'll see later, maybe it means a river bed, even if there's no water in there, you're going to be exempt from the damages caused. Because we don't assume that a fire will go that far. So what we're really dealing with here and in the next Mishnah is how far, you know, where are the limits of where we assume your fire is going to go in order to make you liable. Beyond certain limits, we're going to assume you're not liable anymore because chances are the fire is not going to go there. Vahatanya, but wait, doesn't it say in a bright avra gadir shu gavoa arba amot hayav? If it passes over a four ama high wall, you're liable. So how do we deal with the bright and our Mishnah? Our Mishnah said four amot high wall doesn't, right? Four cubits. Not a problem. And this one says it is a problem. So I'm a rough papa. It's kind of a, fun, a cute answer. Tana didan kachashav milamala lamata. Ours was talking about from going up down, from, you'll see, from higher numbers lower. They were saying, at six, you'll be exempt. At five, you'll be exempt. Ad patur. Until you get to four amot, you're going to be exempt. But but the bright is saying, well, at four amot, though, you're high. Okay, so they're basically, we're going to say, and, and Tanabara, the bright, Mila Mata Lamala, was going in the other direction. And was saying, Two amo, you'll be liable. Three amo high, you're still going to be liable because we can assume that fire is going to go over. Ad Until you get to four, you're going to be liable. So what they would each say at four isn't so clear. But what they're basically saying is by saying four, you're liable and four, you're not liable, you're actually saying the same thing because one is just saying that's the cut. They're each saying that's the cutoff point. It's a matter of you're know, looking at the, the cup half full or the cup half, half empty. Which are we looking at? The pator part or the chayab part? Either which way, they're both saying the cutoff is four. So that's not really a problem. Amarava, arba amocha amru de patu afilu bestei kotsi. says, even if you have a field full of thorns, and we already said thorns, right, uh, light on fire very easily, you could have a field full of thorns. We still don't think it's going to go over a four cubit high wall. However, comes your papa and he says, Amara papa, if you have a field of thorns, mispat kotsim ulamala arba amot because it's so highly flammable. And this could create this big fire. Now, the height of where the thorns are, that's where we start counting the four cubits, okay? Because we assume if it's highly flammable, if it goes on fire and it's at a height of, let's say, six amot and your wall is four amot, well, it's gonna basically jump across. So therefore, we're gonna say, when we say four amot for a stekotzim, for a thorny field, we're, go we're gonna basically say, that it has to be four cubits from the, the height of the, the bushes, the thorny bushes. From there, four amot high. And then it won't go over the fence. Anything lower than that, it will. Now we're going to have a machlok at Rav and Shmuel. And I'll already tell you there's many different interpretations of what we're going to talk about. Do they argue in a kolachat or nichfefet case? So it's about what type of fire. It's a big debate about what these statements mean. And there's actually a big debate on what this is is referring to. Okay, let's start with that. The Mishnah talks about a case where it goes over the fence. That's really the topic we're in right now. And soon the Gemara is going to move to the next one, which is O Derech Rabim, okay, or it passes through the public thoroughfare. But it seems to me like the easier way to understand the sugya or the more clear way is to say that right already now we're referring to Derech Rabim. And this doesn't have to do with um, the fence case. It has to do with when there's a big open space. And then we're going to say it depends on what type of fire you have. 
And then again, there's a debate about what these two types are. So we'll go with the interpretation that goes with that this is talking about the big thoroughfare. I know this is a lot of talking outside before we get inside. So again, you'll see in a minute as I get through it, which is there's kolachad in but let's just define the terms according to, again, some explanation. Some even in the Yerushalmi, it says kodachat and not kolachat. But if you say kolachat, we assume it means, again, different interpretation, but we'll go with one. The, the flames are going upward. They're basically a standing fire as opposed to nichfefet, from like lichfot, litkofet, to bend down, it's a low fire, which spreads very easily on the ground. And that's why it makes, we're going to see right now, lo shanu, Rav says, lo shanu ela bekolachat. When we say again, now, which phrase we're talking about, we don't know, but let's assume it's going on the words, odera harabin. If it passes through a public thoroughfare, and there's now a public thoroughfare is 16 ama wide. If it passes through that width of space with nothing in it, we assume the fire is not going to go beyond, so you're not going to be liable if it happens to pass that. That's in a fire that's going upward. But if the fire is nichfefet, it's low and it spreads very easily, it could spread very easily across 16 ama. And therefore, that's not what the mission is exempting you in that case. Afilu ad mea So Rav says, if it's that low fire, which spreads very quickly to the sides, then even 100 cubits, you're going to be liable. You can see why it's hard to say that this is talking about the fence case, because if you define kolacha nechfefet the way I just did, which is not my interpretation, but if you define it that way, it's very hard to say that it's that it's talking about a fence, because why would a low fire jump over a fence, right? It, it would be the opposite, almost, you would think. So let's explain it that way. This is, by the way, the way Rashi explains it, okay? Um, I'm going strictly with Rashi. This is all found in Rashi. Shmuel Amar, matnitim b'nechfefet, ava b'cholachat, afilu koshu patuk. Now, everyone agrees that kolachat is, is exempt for, uh, exempt in more cases, you know, is the more lenient case, the more, the less likely that the fire will catch. Just Shmuel puts his line elsewhere. What does he say? The Mishnah, which distinguished between Rashid Arabim passing or not Rashid Arabim, right? If it's less than 16 Amma, you'll be liable. If it's 16 Amma, you won't be. That's b'nechfefet. Because when it's low and it spreads, we assume it will spread, but we don't assume it will spread as far as 16 cubits far of, of dead space. Aval bekolacha, but if it's a, a going upward, a feel koshu patu. That kind of fire doesn't spread sideways. And therefore, even if you have a little bit of space between you and let's say your neighbor, we don't expect it to jump from you to your neighbor or from you know wherever you lit it to the next place over. Okay, what a kol shu is, is a good question because what a fire doesn't spread at all. And what, what exactly do we mean? How do we define these kind of fires? And again, that's why there's a lot of debates about what exactly this means. This is one interpretation only that I'm giving you, but there's many, many more. Tanya kavate de We now have a bright to the proof of where it says it explicitly. In what case are we referring to? Bekolachat. But aval v'nichfetet ve'etzi mitzuima. If it's low and there happen to be trees around, afilu ab mea mil chayat. This is mea meal. A meal is like a mile. Okay, that's way more than mea ama, which Rav said. But if you you could go a hundred miles and the fire still keeps going, you'll be liable. Okay, if it's that kind of fire, that kind of fire is is really dangerous. And that whole thing is exactly Rav, who said benichvefet, you're going to be liable even if it's way beyond the uh, uh, you know that small space. Avran nahav o shlulit shehem rechavim. Okay, the Brita continues and says, if there's a river going through, or a shlulit, a shlulit in modern Hebrew is a puddle. Today we're going to see there's a debate about what exactly a shlulit means in, in those times. But let's just assume a puddle. Shehem rechavim shmona amot, an eight ama wide puddle. It reminds me, there's this place in Israel where they have, it's called the shlulit hachoreth. It's this huge, gigantic puddle that, you know, really, really wide. It's in Netanya if you ever want to visit it. Patur, you're exempt. Okay, so Shmona Amo wide, eight cubits wide, you are exempt if there's a, a river or a big, big puddle that wide. Derech Harabim. Now we get to the Derech Harabim. This is the weakness in Rashi because now the Gemara quotes Derech Harabim, but that could be an editing issue and it really should have been earlier. Mantana, who's the Tana who says that the Rashid Harabim width is the width that we're talking about, that a fire won't spread. Well, you didn't read the next Mishnah, or I don't think you did. If you did, then you'll know this. But if you didn't read the next Mishnah yet, which we'll see very soon today, I'm a rabbi, Rabbi Leezer, he, okay, he says, this opinion is Rabbi Leezer, did not, as it says in the next Mishnah, Rabbi Leezer Omer, Sheshes Le'amot, Kederech Rashid Harabim. 
He says that's the amount of space, 16 cubits, that we don't expect a fire to be passing. Onahal. Now we get to the river part. Rav Amar Nahar Mamash, another machlok at Rav and Shmuel. Rav says we're actually talking about a, a real river, an actual river. Shmuel Amar Arita Didelai. He says, no, we even mean a water channel. It could be just a water channel, not necessarily a river. Manda Amar, so now we're going to have a bit of a, if you say this, would you agree with that? If you say that, would you agree with that? Or, or what the difference is really. So Manda Amar Nahar Mamash, if you say a river, Afagav de Lekamaya, even if there's no water in the river, Okay, because a riverbed is, is kind of the same in terms of it causing the separation. But Manda Amara Rita de Delay, but if you're talking about a water channel, it's basically bringing water to irrigate the fields, it's much narrower, it's not as wide as a river. And therefore, if there's water in it, it will stop it. If there's not water, then that's really not going to be significant at all. Tanan Hatam, now they bring a Mishnah in Pea, which they don't exactly talk about why they're bringing this. But you'll see, first of all, they get to defining what a shlulit is. Perhaps they're bringing it for that purpose, because um, we mentioned the shlulit before. But they're talking about a similar thing, which is now here we're talking about what separates spaces that we don't expect a fire to pass. In Pea, it's talking about, it's actually the first mission in the second chapter, what defines a field. Every field, you need to leave a 60th of the field, the corner of the field. If I have two fields, I have to leave a 60th in both of them. If I have one field, if it's all considered one big field, I only need to leave one corner. It's still the same amount in the end. I'd still need to leave one sixtieth of the bigger field, but I only need to leave it in one space, in the corner of one field, rather than in the corner in two different corners of two different fields that I'd have to leave. It's very important to know what distinguishes this to be considered a different field than the one next to it. So elomafsikin the pea, these things considered that they distinguish two fields, one from the other. Hanach, hanach, hanachal, okay, a stream, a river like we're talking about. Hashlulit, a puddle, or we'll see, maybe it doesn't mean a puddle. V'derech hayachid, a path, let's say you have a path through my field, or derech harabim, or if the public thoroughfare goes right through my two fields, then that's going to distinguish those as two fields. I'll have to leave a corner of one and a corner of the other for the poor people. My shlulit, so now they define what exactly is a shlulit. And now you'll get where the modern Hebrew word puddle comes from. Why, why is it called a shlulit? It's a place where rainwater collects. That's exactly what a puddle is. And the word sholilim means collects, and that's how we got to shluli. So that's just explaining it as a puddle the way we would understand a puddle. It's a water channel that distributes, right? It has tributaries. It distributes water to all different fields. So that's shalal is booty, right? It's it's giving what's important, what everybody wants to each of the different fields. If you say it's a place where the water is collected, all the more so you're going to say it also refers to this water channel, right? That if a, if a huddle basically separates, then obviously a water channel that's going through is going to separate into two fields. But if you say it's a water channel, but you're not going to think that a puddle is actually going to be a separation. Right? A puddle is a very temporary thing. And you know it's not really the kind of thing that separates between fields. They're just called the, the yeah, what's the good translation of that? If someone has an English there, but they're just called like the um, the bowl of the of the land, okay? Like these bowls that just get created. It's not really a separator. So depending on which one you hold would explain what you would hold about the other. Okay, that was an aside. Perhaps we really just got there to define what shlulit is that we mentioned in a previous bright time. Okay, yeah, basin's a good word. Thank you. New Mishnah. And now there's a big question, again, another debatable point from today's staff. What this mission has to do with the previous? Is it talking about the same case? Is it talking about a different case? So we're starting at the mission now at the top of Amabit. And it's a debate what exactly the case is and how it connects with the previous mission. So the previous mission had said, if there's derech harabim, a pro public thoroughfare going in between, or a river, you're exempt. So let's just read this as assuming it's referring right now to the same case, really. And it's coming to disagree or perhaps bring different opinions to that issue. So amadlik betoch shelo, if you light a fire in your own field, ad kamatab or Okay, it sounds like it's talking about the exact same question as the previous mission, which makes it a little bit strange. Why did this just all come up there? So how far does the fire go that you will still be liable? 
Rabbi Elazar ben Azari Omer, lo inoto ki ilu hu be'emtza beit kor. It would be the radius of a beit kor field. If you remember, beit kor has 30 say on it. Okay, it would be the radius of that. I believe I saw that it would be, I hope I'm not incorrect about this. The radius of this would be 176 cubits. Okay, so that's an important number to compare it to the others because this isn't the, the, the beit kor measurement doesn't really compare to the other measurements, which are going to be in cubits. So if we once we turn it into cubits, we convert it into cubits, it makes more sense to understand the difference between these. So it's as if you're standing in the middle of a bait core field looking outward. So that would be the radius of a bait core field. Rabbi Eliezer Omer Shesh Asreyamot, 16 cubits. That's Kederek Rashud HaRabim, right? As that's what we already quoted him before, that he seems to match what the previous Mishnah said. Rabbi Akiva Omer Hamishim Amah, we're going to have four opinions. Rabbi Akiva says 50 cubits. You can see the big difference between them. 16, 50, or 176, okay, if, I, if, I, if I did read that number right. And Rabbi Shimon Omer, Shalem Yishalem HaMavir Et HaBeira, HaKol Lafiyad Leka. Okay, right now, the Gemara is going to understand Rabbi Shimon is saying the following. Shalem Yishalem means you're going to pay in any case. Right? Double language means in any case. And that, therefore, it means wherever 137 okay 137 um okay thank you Ruth for pointing that out so the number should be 137 uh, cubits so shalem that means it sounds like it means wherever your fire goes in other words it all depends on your fire if your fire goes there of course you're obligated what well, why would you not be obligated so the gemara immediately and the only thing the gemara is really going to deal with is rabbi shimon Rabbi Shimon doesn't think that there's a certain um, range of where a normal fire will go and beyond that, we're not going to obligate you. It says in the Mishnah the following thing. This sounds like a, like in the army, they always give you a, a rules in the beginning, make sure not to do this and that and the other thing. So, you know, so that my, my son at some point was in charge of all that stuff. So I remember him telling me all about it, like, you have to review every time you go out, what are the rules and what do you have to be worried about might happen. So these are the general rules. When you have an oven in your house, which is going to have a fire coming out of it, don't put it without four cubits space between the top of the, the of the, your oven and the roof, because otherwise, and your ceiling, because otherwise it could burn right through the roof or over the ceiling. And by the way, someone could be upstairs and it could cause them damage. And then you'll be liable for damages for ruining their floor. If you're living upstairs and someone else is downstairs, you have to build something three cubits, uh, three tfachim high to get it off the ground so that again, you prevent it from burning through the floor, which is the root, you know, the, the ceiling of the person below you. If it's a kira, now a kira was more like our burners. It's like a single burner and it's less hot than an oven. So there, a tefach is enough to put underneath. The in hizik, mishalei mash hizik. Well, these are precautionary, okay? So do this to avoid problems. But in the end, if something happens, you're reliable for damages anyway. Rabbi Shimon, who's the one who interests us here, omel, lo ne'emru shiurin halalu, ela she'im hizik, patrom el shalem. What are you talking about? Why did they give you these measurements? It wasn't just, okay, well, these things prevent fire, but, you know, they're not foolproof. No, it's to say that if you follow these rules and you do everything the way you're supposed to, and despite that, a fire breaks out and you destroy something of your neighbor, your upstairs or your downstairs neighbor, you are not liable. That's the whole point. If I did what I was supposed to do and something happened anyway, well, then it's not my fault. So what do you see here? He clearly says that there are limitations. It's not a call the fiat leka. If there's a fire, there's a fire. No, if I if I did the right thing and there was space between me and the neighbor, like in the Mishnah, a lot of space, it shouldn't have gotten there. Then I'm not liable. So what did it mean a call the fiat leka? Amarav Nachman Amarav Ravua a call the gova had leka. It all depends on what kind of fire you built. If you built a very small fire and then somehow it caught and spread way farther than it should have, then you're not liable. But if you built a huge bonfire and you weren't careful about it and then it went and spread, well, then we're going to make you liable for damages that could go as far as, you know, anywhere. As long as, right, if you built something that had the potential to go very far, then we're going to make you liable. This is 
an interesting and, and particularly interesting, I'll, I'll continue one more minute and I'll say what I want to say, which is Amar of Yosef, Amar of Yehud, Amar Shmuel, Halacha to Rabbi Shimon, V'chein Amar of Nachman, Amar Shmuel, Halacha to Rabbi Shimon. So Rabbi Yehuda quoted, Rabbi Yosef quoted, Rabbi Yehuda quoted Rabbi Shmuel, and Rabbi Nachman quoted Shmuel as possibly like Rabbi Shimon. How do you define this? It's very difficult, right? It all depends on the size of your fire. Well, give us some more guidelines. What size, what this, what that, right? You can imagine it's a little bit complicated to figure out how to implement this halacha lamase. But that is, in fact, seems to be the way we pass. New Mishnah. Now we're going to get to, and, and today's topic from here to the end of the daf and into tomorrow's is going to be all about Tamun Be'esh, where we started from, okay? We started with the David story that perhaps that was what David Amelech was asking about. This issue of things hidden. And what we're going to learn now is it's not so clear cut that every case the rabbis say, if it's hidden, you're exempt. Okay, that's number one. And how you calculate damage when there is something hidden is also going to be something we didn't really discuss. So that's all going to come up in our mission already. If you light up on fire, a pile of grain, let's say, and in the middle of that pile were some vessels, you have to pay whatever was in there. If there were 90 grains of wheat and a mug that you destroyed. So you have to pay the value of the mug and the value of the 90 grains. The chachamim obrim, eino mashalem ela gadish shal chitim o shal seorim. You pay based on the value of it being of grains, you know, whether it was wheat or whether it was barley. What does that mean? So we'll see it in the very last bright we're going to end with today. What it really means here is to say the following. Let's say the pile was a pile that could have held 100 grains of wheat, but Instead of 100 grains of wheat, since there was a mug in the middle of that, the mug took up space of, let's say, 10 grains. So what happened? Again, the, the numbers are just random. It's not really, it doesn't make so much sense, but let's just say. So if you have this pile, if it didn't have the mug in it, I burnt this pile of grains that were yours. Now, if the mug took up the space of seven, maybe stalks is a better, right, of seven stalks of wheat, therefore... So uh, I'm sorry, of 10. So instead of being 100, there were 90, like the example I gave. According to Rabbi Yehuda, you pay the 90 stocks and you pay the mug. According to the rabbis, you don't just pay the 90 stocks. You don't pay for the mug at all, but you pay for 100. You pay for the size pile that you destroyed as if it were full of grains, okay? That's what he says, basically. So it doesn't matter whether it's stocks, whether it's kernels, it doesn't make a difference. The point is, we view that pile, since I destroyed a pile that could have held X number, it didn't because it was something else inside. So we exempt me for the something else inside, but we make me liable for the size pile that I destroyed. So whereas Rabbi Yudah will only be obligate you for 90, the rabbis will obligate you for 100. Now Rabbi Yudah obviously makes you obligated for whatever was inside, which could be worth a lot of money, right? We don't know what you destroyed. It could be worth almost nothing. But either which way, they get to very different amounts. Now we get to a line that we've seen a few times already. So it's fun. If there was a, uh, uh, an animal that was tied to there and there was a Canaanite slave that was next to the pile and you burnt the pile and with that burnt the Eved and the Gedi. Now the Eved, we assume, should have run away. So you're not actually liable for damages for the Eved, but you are Chayav for the Gedi because the Gedi had no choice but was stuck there. And... The pile, obviously, you're liable for it. Eved kafutlo gdi samuchlo v'nisrafi mo pator. But if the eved is tied down and can't move, then you're liable for killing the eved. Once you're liable for killing the eved, him lebederabamine kicks in. You're only liable for the death penalty. You no longer have to pay. So you don't pay for the gdi and you don't pay for the um, the pile because you're exempt from all damages because in that act, you actually made yourself liable the death penalty. And then there's this idea that you get exempt, which again, we'll see that idea more in depth when we get to Sanhedrin. Umodim, okay, so that's the machloka between them. Then we have this case of a fire. They give us these details and this has to do with a whole different halakha of Kim Lebedurab Amine. Now we go back to the machloka of things hidden. So that had nothing to do with things hidden. Umodim chachamim l'Rabbi Yehuda b'maligat habira shehu mashalem koma shebetocha shekein derech b'nei adam lahaniach b'batim. Now the rabbis say, well, listen, what does it mean hidden? Hidden is like in a pile of grains where there's something underneath that you know, we don't see. But if I do a bira, I burn a bira, which is a big, tall building, some sort of tower. And in the tower, there's 
coffee cups and other things that normally are in towers or houses, that's not considered tamun, right? I could say, oh, well, I burnt that down. I didn't know there was anything inside. I couldn't see it from outside. No, because a house generally has things in it. A pile of grains generally doesn't have things in it other than grains. So in that case, the rabbis are going to agree with Rabbi Yehuda that that is a case where something you could claim is perhaps hidden, but that we don't call that hidden. And therefore, you'll be liable for damages. To which the Gemara starts off with Rav Kahana. We're going to have a machlok at Rav and Rav Kahana about the machlok at Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis. I'm a Rav Kahana. Machlok at v'malik betoch shalo, v'alchav ha'achla betoch shal chavero. We're now going to start distinguishing between two different cases, which are actually two very smart cases to distinguish between. One is I made a fire in my property and it spread to yours. Okay, that's like basic negligence. I wasn't careful about it. Like negligent in the sense that I wasn't intentional about it, but I wasn't careful and my fire spread. Versus a case where I go, what we call arson. I go into your property and I make a fire there, okay? I, I don't even think it matters if I intentionally managed, intended to burn something there like arson, or I just made a fire which caught on. But I was in your property. So Rav Kana distinguishes between those two cases. And he says, They argue if you're making a fire in your own house, and then it spreads. Because Rabbi Yehuda says you're liable. And the rabbis exempt you. Okay, because... It's already, we're going to be much more lenient when it's, you made a, a fire in your property and you weren't careful enough, but it spread. We'll be more lenient, just like we said, we're more lenient when your animal does it than when you do the damage yourself. But, but this whole exemption of Tamun is because we're going to be more lenient with you because, you know, you anyway made it in your own property and it just happened to spread. But if, and you know, obviously you're going to be liable for the damages of the fire, just not if something's hidden. But this whole exemption of hidden is not going to be in a case, according to Rav Kahana, where you actually made a fire in someone else's property. We're going to be much more strict with you and obligate you for all the damages you cause. Which Rav doesn't like this. I'm really Rav. Ihachi. It doesn't make sense with our Mishnah. Because what did our Mishnah end with? The Mishnah already set up a case where the rabbis are going to agree with Rabbi Yehuda. So if the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda about the case that you're saying, Rav Kahana, it should have said it in the Mishnah. When it already started saying they agree in a house that anything tamun is not tamun, it should have also said, it should have distinguished there. And said, It should have said, this is only right, the rabbis agree, right? they're only talking in a case where you made a fire in your own house. But if you lit the fire in someone else's house, they would agree with the rabbi, with Rabbi Yehuda as well, that you'd be chayav. And the fact that the Mishnah doesn't say this must mean it's just not true, because the Mishnah had the like the perfect opportunity, the perfect opening to start making that distinction. Ela Amarava, Rava therefore says betarte plige. They actually argue in both cases, but he is going to make a minor distinction. Plige b'malik betoch shalov ha'chava achla betoch shal chaviro. In the case where I made a fire in my own house and it spread to yours, then to Rabbi Yehuda mechayev atamun be'esh, Rabbi Nan sabri lo mechayev. Okay, basic machloket. Rabbi Huda says, you're high for anything I, that burns from that fire, even if it was hidden under a pile of grains when it spread to your house. But the rabbis say, no. But also if I burned in your house. Rabbi Yehuda says, if I made a fire in your house, I'm liable for everything. Even if you have a wallet, which never really is found in the middle of your pile of grains. But if you had a wallet there, I'd be liable for whatever was in your wallet. To, but Rabbanan Savle, you're going to be high on what? Things that are typically found in a pile of grains, like Kalim Shadarkalatmin Bagadish, Kigom Morigin, Ukle Bakar. Okay, there were threshing tools or the yoke that you use on the animal for the work they do in the field. That often people stuck in the middle of the pile of grains. They would do that. That's typically found there. Since it's typically found, I should have anticipated it was there and therefore I'm liable for damages. Only in a case that where I lit the fire in your property. But if there are things that generally are not found in the pile, then no. And with this, we'll end with some with this beginning of a brighter that we're going to see much more the detail of the brighter tomorrow. I light up the same case. I light up a pile of grains and there were vessels inside. Rabbi Yehuda says, you pay for all the damage. 
חכמים אומרים, אינו משלם על הגדיש של חיטים או גדיש של שעורים. And here it says it more explicitly, ורואים מקום כלים כאילו הוא מלא תבואה. You view the space where the כלי was, the vessel was, as if it was full of grains, and that's how you assess the damage. That's what we explained the mission in the first place. So quick review of our daf, we started with the David HaMelech story, three interpretations, and we analyzed it based on all the psukim and said, how does this pasuk, how is it explained according to each option? Then we went to the different, the, the space or the objects or the way that if you have a wall, if you have a space, if you have a river, or maybe a, a water channel, right? We discussed all the different possibilities and the different opinions about what would prevent theoretically my fire from getting to a different place. And if it does anyway, what would make me not liable to pay for the damages done by that fire? And from that, we moved into Tamun, whether something is Tamun is exempt or not, the whole Machlok of Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis, and the Machlok of Rav Kahn and Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi, uh, Rav Kahn and Rabbi, about what case they argue about and on which cases do they agree. And with that, we'll finish for today, wishing everybody a good day and hoping for good news today.